Yeah, good job. Cool. It was good. It was all great. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, is everybody enjoying WordCamp? Yes. yes. All right, that sounds like a Sunday morning. I went to the after party last night enjoying WordCamp. Yeah. How many people is it uh, your first WordCamp ever? Oh my gosh, I love how it's always like a billion people. Like we keep having them all over the place and every time there's always so many new people. That's so exciting. This is not my first WordCamp, but it is my first WordCamp Atlanta. So I'm so thrilled to be here. It's been really, really fun. Thanks for the welcome. Um, a little more about me. Hi, so I'm Michelle, like you saw, um, and I design and build digital interfaces. So my background was in design, uh, visual communications is what I studied in school. Um, currently, I do front end development and I also do a lot of strategy focused UX design. Uh, but my first freelance job ever, uh, right when I was still in college, was actually doing banner and header animations in Flash for Career Builder, like for some of their, so yeah, back in, right, that was a thing. So um, I've been doing animation since, well, it was, you know, Flash was never, it, it was cool, but it was never cool. Um, and I was doing that for a while. Uh, but obviously nowadays, we don't have Flash anymore, right? But we still have uh, plenty of animation, right? We have even more great technologies that enable us to interact uh, with all sorts of stuff on websites. We've got uh, JavaScript, obviously, and modern CSS even allows us to do a whole bunch of animation. Uh, so we can do a lot of things that let us interact dynamically with our websites. Uh, so in the modern age, in the enlightened age, the, the post-Flash age, right, what does that look like? Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> although we have left Flash and MySpace behind, uh, animation still causes problems on the web. Uh, you've probably noticed if you go to a website, uh, some of the stuff you see is very, it's very resource intensive, right? Like there's just, the struggle is real when it comes to loading and there's usually bandwidth issues. Uh, a lot of animation on the web right now, you'll probably agree, is like very overdone, it's unnecessary, it's annoying, it's complex. Um, and if you, if, if there's too much motion going on, if there's too much, uh, it leads to purposeful ignorance, right? It's like the, the ad blindness effect. So you, you just think that it's a banner ad, like the ones I used to build for Career Builder, and just ignore it, right? So there's a lot of kind of problems with animation on the web right now. Uh, and one of the biggest ones is the, the parallax website trend. How many of you have seen a parallax website, right? How many of you have built a parallax website? You don't have to admit to it. It's OK if you don't want to. Yeah. So. Um, there's a uh, group called the Nielsen Group, which I'm basically just going to quote them all the time. And if you take anything away from this talk, it's just do whatever the Nielsen Group says. Cool. Um, but they're basically one of the foremost authorities on user experience. And they did a study on parallax websites. And what they found is that users find them very, very difficult to control. Uh, obviously, they take longer to load, which is a problem, especially if you don't have a really great internet connection. Uh, users find them disorienting, they find them dizzying, they find them distracting, and honestly, they're, they don't even find them that cool. Uh, it's, so it sounds like it's really just like not that worth it to do one of these complex parallax websites. Like It's not that cool for all of the problems that it causes. There's also a concept in animation called jank. This is from like the, the regular animation industry. And it's basically in an animation, you've probably seen this, uh, where there is stuttering. There, one of those is mine. Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. There we go. Got it. Um, there's, uh, there's stuttering. There's halting. It's breaking the flow. So it's basically when you, you notice that the, something's wrong with the animation, right? So this is called jank. I just really like this word. Um, and this happens a lot on the web when the animation can't keep up with you know, bandwidth or it loads improperly, right? So there's a lot of problems that are with animation nowadays. Uh, but I am not saying that animation is the enemy. Uh, it can still be an extremely useful tool. And the point of my presentation is to answer this question, how can we avoid these problems and use animation effectively, right? So let's, let's avoid jank. Let's avoid over complex sites. Uh, how many of you have heard of the 12 principles of animation? We're like kind of close to Florida, so I figured maybe some of you are Disney fans, right? Mm -hmm. um, but these were, were 12 principles that were developed by the original Disney animators at Disney Animation Studios. And they're also published as a really great book that looks super impressive on your coffee table. Uh, I've got one, obviously, because you know I want people to think I'm smart. Um, but what's really cool about these is they were created in the very early days of animation when they were trying to define what is animation as a storytelling medium. 
uh, to provide a platform to make animations feel more physically and more psychologically believable. So basically, we're going to be talking about how to convey physics and psychology in 2D. That is the point of the 12 principles of animation. Uh, so number one is uh, squash and stretch. So how many of you have, have uh, heard of squash and stretch? This is usually one that people have seen before. Uh, squash and stretch, if you've ever seen a, a bouncing ball in slow motion, this is a real thing that happens. You know, the ball, it goes down, and when it hits the ground, it kind of compresses, and then it springs back up. That's exactly what's happening here in this animation. And what squash and stretch does is it's used to convey the physics of mass. Right? Because materials have mass and the materials have flexibility. They're impacted by gravity. They might behave differently depending on what a material is. Uh, so using squash and stretch effectively gives you some sense of the physics of mass of that material that you are animating. There's also a principle called anticipation, where uh, it needs energy to start and stop. And this is also physics. This is a concept called inertia, right? Which means that you know an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. So we're seeing like that energy that's needed to like start a thing moving. Um, it also can be used to add sentience to a thing, like a wind up before a pitch, or like getting ready to run before you take off from a starting line. So anticipation is this thing, this sense of energy before something starts moving. It just makes it feel more uh, physically believable. Uh, there's a concept called staging. Now, this isn't a, a physics or concept. It's basically just any kind of art direction concept, but it's guiding the viewer to the most important part of the stage. And it can be any number of things. Uh, you could be using movement. You could be using a little burst like this thing is. But you can also use uh, the layout. You can also use focus. You can use relationships between different things. Basically, staging is anything that helps guide the viewer to wherever you want them to look. Uh, there's a couple of concepts in animation, uh, straight ahead action versus pose to pose. Now, if any of you ever worked in Flash, did any of you ever do any work in Flash? So um, you may have uh, experience with keyframing, right? And so straight ahead action is where you literally draw each of the keyframes, right? And there's some stuff you can do in CSS that's very similar to this. And pose to pose is basically what you could do in uh, Flash by tweening. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, in regular animation, it was basically like laying out all of the keyframes, and, and, and then it was like you have to draw each one. Or it was drawing the main poses, and then just letting the junior animator figure out what goes in between all of those poses. right? So those are some different animation concepts. Uh, here's another physics concept. Uh, it's called follow through and overlapping action. And this also has to do with the physics of mass, the physics of a thing. Um, so uh, different differences in mass, for example, um, if, I, if I'm moving, like different parts of my body are probably going to stop at different times because they weigh different things, they're doing different things. My hair is probably going to do something different than the rest of my body if I stop. I mean, I don't have long hair, but if I did, it would just go in my face when I stop running, for example. I don't know why I'd be running. That sounds terrible. Um, <laughs> But also, it has to do with, like, you know, this thing is a tall thing, right? And so when it gets started, the top of it's going to tend to keep going, right? And then it's going to slow down differently. So again, it's behaving believably. This is how an object probably would actually behave if it was a random sentient rectangle going back and forth on a screen. Uh, this is another concept that has to do with acceleration. There's a lot of physics happening here. Uh, and this is called the slow in and slow out. We've also uh, talked about easing. I'm going to talk about easing a little bit later. But that's basically this concept. Things don't just immediately be at speed and then immediately stop. Right? They usually have to accelerate. Again, that inertia concept. They usually have to decelerate to stop. It might be quick. It might be slow. Uh, but there's not, it's not instantaneous. And so this is this concept of easing. There's also the concept of an arc. Uh, so again, we're going back to physics. I, luckily, I liked physics a lot when I was in school, so this is good. But uh, objects in aerial motion tend to follow an arc, uh, assuming that there's no air resistance or whatever. Uh, and obviously, we all know from physics that we never account for air resistance. It's always spherical objects in a vacuum. Uh, <laughs> I think it's funny. No one else laughs. It's OK. <laughs> physics joke. Um, but anyway, objects that move through the air tend to move through an arc. They don't move in straight lines. And so this is just another concept of believability. Uh, secondary action is basically supporting 
motion, and this has to do with physics and with psychology. Uh, physics, because of the attention to detail, again, if I'm running and I had long hair, my hair would probably behave differently. It would probably be behind me when I'm running, and then it would kind of fly up into my face when I stop. Um, so that's kind of that physics of the different parts of your body. Uh, psychology, though, it adds to the element of believability, right? Because the more secondary motion that's happening, the more it feels like this is a thing that's real. If any of you watched Monsters, Inc., it was a really big deal when they animated all of the hairs on Sully. Um, that's an, ex an example of secondary action because it's a small detail that makes it more believable that yet this is a hairy monster walking through air, right? Um, concept called timing. So this has to do a lot with several different parts of physics. Uh, these, these are shaped the same, they're doing the same thing, but you kind of believe that they're very, very different materials or they're very different weights or the little boxes have very different strengths or very different uh, levels of acceleration. Uh, so timing is a way to convey kind of the presence of an object and whether it's supposed to be heavy or light or quick or slow, or whether there's a lot of friction, or it's really you know, easy to move. Uh, these are all concepts that can be talked about through timing. And exaggeration, this is a uh, psychological thing. So actually, kind of like how if you're wearing stage makeup, um, on stage it looks great, but if you see them in real life walking down the street, you'd be like, oh my goodness, right? Um, exaggeration makes something seem more believable if you overemphasize it. So when you're doing animation, obviously this is, you know, obviously, square teeth chomping, but that's very, very exaggerated. If it was more subtle, maybe it wouldn't seem as, as right, like it would just seem a little bit off. Concept of solid drawing uh, basically means that we believe the object can physically exist because it's following consistent principles of existing in space, right? Like it's not going through itself or contorting itself in some weird space-time continuum wibbly wobbly way like it is following the principles of solid drawing it behaves consistently with itself it behaves consistently with its environment you know everything is following the same vanishing points etc that's solid drawing and then we have this this concept called appeal and this is very psychological this is basically just like you know the heart and soul of the thing like is it delightful is it fun is it personable uh, this is very very subjective obviously but a lot of brands try to add appeal to their brand right like Mailchimp's a great example of a brand that just tries to add a little bit of appeal a little bit of personality uh, but this is kind of the final principle of animation and it's just a little thing of like adding adding a soul to your to your object right uh, so this was super fun and it made a lot of sense I'm sure but like how how useful is this to us like that was really cool to watch rectangles fly through space but what does that have to do uh, with web animation right uh, so what do these principles provide to us uh, what these things give us is realism so they let us establish how things would actually behave in the real world. Uh, they give us context, so they establish spatial relationships uh, between states, between different objects, and between all of these things and their stage. They give us causality, so we know that one thing is influencing another thing, uh, an action is influencing an object, we can see the reaction there. They give us focus, again, we're directing attention to the most important elements. And they give us delight, right? They give us some positive experiences, they give us personality, that's back to that appeal concept. All right, so now I'm done with all the philosophy parts, so I hope that was super fun. We're going to go into practical stuff, which is uh, what are the properties we can animate and in what way can we animate them? So this is an animation vocabulary lesson, not that it wasn't before, but we're going into it now. So what are different elements that we can animate, right? Um, one is color. Uh, you can animate the fill of an object, you can animate the border of an object, right? You can change the color in some way. Uh, you can animate the location of an object, right? Where it is relative to everything else. You can animate the scale. Is it going to get bigger? Is it going to get smaller? You can animate the shape. You know, we're, we talked about tweening. You can change the shape of something into something else. You can animate the focus. You can make it more, more in focus and more out of focus. And you can animate the opacity, right? You can make it uh, more uh, opaque or more transparent. So these are all different things that you can animate uh, on the web. Uh, well, I said I'd talk about easing, and this is like my favorite animation on this whole thing. It's so hypnotic. <laughs> I just want to stare at it. But easing is that, that slow in, slow out thing that we talked about. Um, easing in is basically accelerating. So that means you're starting slow and you're getting faster. That's called easing in. Um, easing out, uh, I'm sure you can guess, is slowing down or decelerating, right? 
And then there's also the concept of bounce, and we talked about the follow through earlier. So bounce is when you use follow through to go slightly past its destination. Uh, it makes it seem like it's lighter. Like if I'm if I'm going to like run and suddenly stop, like I'm not going to suddenly stop gracefully. I'm going to kind of like fall forward a little bit, that's that bounce, that's that follow through. So if you have an object that's kind of bouncing, uh, that means that it kind of happened probably quicker and it's a little bit more believable if it springs towards you. So now we're going to talk a little bit about timing because that was a thing. Um, again, Jacob Nielsen, right, they had a, a study called Three Important Time Limits and these are the three important time limits. I'm going to give you some examples pretty soon. Um, so any response time, if an animation responds in 100 milliseconds or less, it feels pretty much instantaneous. Like that's how your brain works. Some people, it's a little bit different per person, but basically about a, a tenth of a second feels instantaneous. Like it just happened right away. Um, uh, response time of up to one second still felt like it was connected. So I did a thing, within a second if something happens, I feel like the thing I did caused the other thing to happen. So that is like, it's good for navigation, it's good for major state changes, right? Um, after 10 seconds, uh, people tend to lose their train of thought. They don't remember what happened to cause something to, to animate. Uh, so let's go through some examples here. So this is a really good example of a uh, basically an instantaneous, right? So it's usually like some kind of toggle, right? Like a radio button, a toggle, a checkbox. You basically feel like I did it, it happened, instantaneous, done. I mean, there is some animation here, but it's really, really fast. Uh, somewhere in between that that tenth of a second and that one second are maybe some slightly longer animations. So there's like a little more detail. We don't want it to be so fast that people don't see it. We do want it to be noticeable, but it's still well within that flow of thought, right? Um, the, the one second flow of thought, uh, this is great for state changes. So I'm using a lot of examples, by the way, from material design because they just have a lot of really good examples and they've really well documented all of their animation processes. But obviously material design is not the only one out there doing animation. It was just very, very convenient to use them as examples. But here's an example of you click on a thing and there's a page transition. It's within that one second flow of thought because it's really clear like I clicked on a thing and therefore something happened. But because a lot's going on, you want it to take a little bit longer so it feels natural. It doesn't want to just jump out at you. Uh, when we start getting up to that 10 seconds though, uh, when people are losing their train of thought, that's when you want to have some kind of secondary animation in there uh, to indicate that something is going on. Because if you just clicked on something and there was a blank screen and it sat there for 10 seconds and then suddenly some stuff came up, you'd be like, did I break it? Like, did I, did I lose my internet connection? What's happening right now? Um, so that's why progress indicators, loading states, all of that stuff is very, very important when you're starting to get up towards that 10 second side. Um, so how do you choose durations, right? I mean, obviously, the type of thing that you're animating does help influence it. Basically, uh, if you have to travel a greater distance or expand to a greater size, you probably want your animation to take a little bit longer, right, so people can process it. Um, if it's closer to the area of central focus, so it's if, if it's happening right in the middle of the screen, you can probably take a little bit less time because people are staring at it. If it's happening on the periphery of the screen, maybe a little more time so people notice that it's happening. But anyway, this, this study by the, the Nielsen Group on the three important time limits, again, the, I, I will have a link to all the slides so you don't have to feel like you have to read these tiny URLs that are kind of useless in presentation mode. Um, they'll all be there and you can, and you can check it out. Next, transitions. So there's several different things that objects can do. An object can be persistent, which means that it stays on the screen, it stays on the stage. It can be incoming, so it wasn't there, and then it enters the stage. Uh, it can be outgoing, which means it leaves the stage, right? That makes sense. Or it can be static, which means it isn't animated, but it's still an object that the other objects can interact with, so it's still important as part of the animation. These are, these are basically all of your different transitions. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a cut transition. So this is something, it basically means that not, there's an immediate change. There is no transition, state change, done, right? Um, these are very disorienting, right? The, the problem here, there's a lack of orientation. Uh, your brain kind of internally resets as soon as it changes. And there's also uh, change blindness because we, we don't really necessarily remember what was on the previous screen, so it's really hard to see what actually changed specifically. Uh, problem is, obviously, much of the web is powered by cuts, right? Like you load a new page uh, in a traditional website, like that's a cut, that's not an animation. And so that's why we need to do things like 
be consistent between pages. Keep your menus in the same spot. Keep your footers in the same spot. Use a similar layout. Guide people through what they're doing because we have to deal with cuts. And right here, you can see like these are vastly different pages, and it's kind of like I, you know, like things are jumping around, and I don't know why, and like it's it's confusing. I don't know what changed. Uh, so we want to try to mitigate that as much as possible when we're dealing with page changes and things that we can't control the animation for. Uh, a tween, great. So um, here's a great example of a tween. Uh, multiple properties changing at the same time, right? So we have a uh, color change, we have a shape change, we have a size change. Uh, tweening is useful because you can kind of tell where something came from and where it's going, right? So if I just clicked on the purple circle and suddenly there was a white square, I wouldn't necessarily know that the white square came from the purple circle, but here it's pretty clear um, that they, they come from each other. And so that's why tweening is very, very useful. And again, you can tween between any of those uh, things that we talked about earlier that you can animate. Uh, so then there's fading. Uh, there's several different kinds of fading. Uh, you might see like a, a dissolve, which is a standard fade. Basically, something fades out and then something fades in. A, a cross divide is where they're simultaneously fading. So one object might be fading out while another one's fading in, which means if you kind of paused it in the middle, you'd see both of them a little bit. Uh, there's also a fast through sequential fade, which is basically a really quick fade out and really quick fade in. So just different kinds of fades that you can employ. Um, this was like just a cool like layer-based example that, that material design gave us about, about fades, which was I just thought it was nice. Uh, transformation, this is one object becoming another, also known as morphing. Uh, this one just reminds me of all the flash stuff that I used to do. Like, oh, the first time we discovered, oh, you can make a shape turn into another shape. This is so neat. It does it for me. How cool. So that's fun, but probably moderately useless. However, this example with the button is actually a really kind of nice example of transformation to convey useful information, right? So you've got your submit button, you click on it, there's a progress bar, and then it turns into like a success state. That's actually a really cool, useful form of transformation to convey information. Uh, this is a very, very overwhelming slide uh, that I don't expect you to digest, but there was a... Um, a group that put together 12 principles of UX in motion. So they kind of roughly based it on the 12 principles of animation. They made it a lot more specific to web interfaces. Like, here are some specific ways we can use animation on the web. Uh, the URL is uxinmotion.net. Again, the slides will be up so you can see these URLs. But I'd suggest digging into that and taking a look at it. I'm not going to go into detail about this. They do a really good job of talking about it. But these are probably some things that you've seen before in animation on the web. Uh, so now that we know the elements of animation and what we can animate, uh, how do we then use animation uh, semantically and usefully? So basically, what, what value can all of this animation provide to us now that we know how to do it? Uh, well, one thing that animation is great at is establishing uh, context through hierarchy. Uh, it establishes basically hierarchical and spatial relationships. So you can see here uh, the crane example. You know, you click on your your crane icon, and then the app kind of grows out of the icon, right? So it's very it's establishing, hey, this is uh, the the parent icon, and this is the app that comes out of it. Uh, the example in here where you've got your kind of list, and then you click on it, and it grows out from that list. That's great because it's establishing. Um, navigation between different layers. And again, it's also being used to direct your attention to the important element because it's growing out from that. So I just really liked this because it was showing kind of this layer-based animation. So that's what you would see statically. But this is kind of how it feels like you're looking at it. You know, material design is very layer-based. And so um, you know, you're clicking on a thing, and it brings a layer up to the surface, and then it brings it back down. So things that you can do with animation is establishing hierarchy. Uh, there's also several different kinds of relationships that you can establish with animation. Uh, one is the, the, tab to the tab to tab or the scrolling, swiping. Uh, there's a lot of scrolling and swiping going on on the internet right now, especially mobile. Um, but these are basically establishing peer-to-peer -peer or adjacent relationships that are equal, so it's not hierarchical. Um, so for example, the, the dogs and cats, that's a great example of like tabbed uh, relationship. A, a menu button to a drop down. So if you click on a, a button and a menu comes out of it, that's establishing that relationship there. Or uh, when you click on something and a modal or a popover comes up, like establishing that relationship right there. Uh, even uh, toggles, like accordions or drop downs, that's a really great example of being able to use animation. Uh, and uh, loading icons and placeholders to final content. Uh, that was something we talked a little bit about with the duration, if something's going to take a while. But 
A lot of apps like Facebook or Twitter, if you load it kind of on a slow connection, you'll see kind of that blank state flashing at you. But it's implying like here's where the content's going to go. And that's a useful way of establishing a relationship between the placeholder content and the content that will eventually be on the screen. Uh, animations can also be used to provide feedback, right? So if I drag something, I'm showing, hey, I'm going to drag this here, and this is where it's going to be. Everything rearranges so I can see, hey, I'm, I'm doing something here. Um, if I add, this one's cool, you add it to the cart, it just like goes into the cart, like, hey, I added a thing to a cart, right? That's providing useful feedback. Uh, here, it's entering in a passcode, and it's shaking. It's like, no, 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 you did it wrong, right? But that's a little bit of feedback that it's giving just by using animation. And even here with the, um, the checkbox, it's very simple animation, but it's saying like, yes, you clicked on this box. It is now checked. Uh, so it's providing feedback. It's uh, providing whether there's a success or an error state, whether you're dragging or moving or hovering or pressing. These are really great ways to use animation to provide feedback. Uh, you can use animation to indicate status. Um, so like we talked about those pre-state or transition animations, uh, placeholders, uh, like loading new content, like on Facebook or Twitter when you're trying to load something. Also, the loading indicator, if you've got like an Ajax button to load more posts at the bottom of a thing and there's a little spinner, that's a really great example of indicating status, something's happening. Um, state changes, again, stuff like on or off, open or closed, selected or deselected, focused or unfocused, enabled or disabled, great places to be able to indicate status. Um, Indicating progress is super great, so loading bars or pagination, showing where you're at in a, in a stage, uh, and then indicating the function of something. So these are all just like really fun examples of, of indicating the status of something by, yeah, like there's the loading thingy. It's like, hey, more stuff's going to be here. Um, yeah. You can also use animation to give instruction. Um, so this is, it can be anywhere from just a very simple, like, that animation saying, oh, swipe to unlock, I understand, like, it jumps so that you know that you can swipe. Uh, very simple. It can be as complicated as let's build this whole entire, like, thing to teach you how the <coughs> app works. Uh, Slack does some of that. Uh, but, like, hey, we built this whole complicated thing. Um, it can be just a pop-up that, like, shows up with, like, hey, here's an indication of the button you're supposed to click on next. It can be uh, a full walkthrough of your entire thing. It can just indicate where you're at in the process. Uh, these are all really great ways to be able to give instruction using animation. And of course, you can use animation to add delight. Um, I just love this juggling guy. <laughs> oh, I could stare at that forever. He's so cute. Um, but it's, it's giving it a little character, right? So it's loading. And we could have just had a normal loading bar. But instead, we've got this guy juggling because he's setting up your account. Oh, but he's really sad because something went wrong. Oh, no. I don't know. This is just so fun. The, the crane has another good example. It's just a little bit of personality. This one, again, adding personality, you know, you, you kind of pull down and it like shoots the airplane up and then the trees move. Like, is it unnecessary? Yes, but it's fun and it fits whatever that brand is doing. And I absolutely just love this loading bar indicator. It's like, oh, it's happening. It's happening. Oh, no. <sighs> we all felt that before. <laughs> so fun ways to add delight. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, animation and how it's kind of been used to provide information since the earliest visual output on computers. And this, the flashing cursor is like the first computer animation. And it conveys actually a whole lot of information with just this one thing. Uh, first of all, it's conveying hierarchy because it's telling you, hey, this is the thing to look at. This is the most important thing on the screen right now. It's, this is the one thing that's flashing. It's providing feedback. Um, the cur if the cursor moves while you're typing, that means, hey, cool, I am typing, and therefore things are happening. Um, it provides status. Uh, if the cursor is still flashing, that means your computer's still working, because if it stops flashing, you're like, uh-oh, <laughs> something's broken. It's supposed to be flashing. And it's also giving us instruction, because it's like, hey, type here. This is where you, this is where you interact. So just this, this flashing cursor, this really basic thing, is conveying so much information with animation. Right, so now I want to talk a little bit at the end here about using animation responsibly. Because remember, at the beginning, we talked about all of these problems, the bloat, the complexity, all this stuff. All of these things were super, super fun. But how do we know when we should be using them and when we shouldn't, right? So number one, um, does your animation add value? Uh, prioritize animations that will add value, or especially multiple forms of value. What do I mean by that? Uh, does your animation show the user where information 
came from or where it went to? You know, is it conveying some kind of location? Uh, does it indicate progress? You know, does it uh, move the user through an information space? Does it reinforce physics or branding? Like, does it make sense with what you're doing? Uh, does it explain something faster than words or a video could? Sometimes some of those instructional things, it's like a little bit of animation goes a lot better than trying to make users read a document. So does it add value? First question. Second question, uh, are your animation behaviors consistent across your entire site? Uh, it's a better user experience, right, to adopt consistent animation patterns because then everything behaves as expected. If I interact with something one way on one page, I should be able to interact with it similarly on another page. Uh, but also, it's a more streamlined and more maintainable code base when you reuse animation components, right? And so we want to be able to load as few things as possible. We don't need to be super creative every single time. We want to maybe establish a library of patterns. So this is why we want to know, is our animation behavior consistent? Uh, is, uh, is it still functional without it? Right? It may not be as delightful or as easy, but we want to offer an alternative or feedback. So we don't want our animation to be mission critical to the thing working, uh, especially if your animation is done by uh, cutting edge CSS that maybe not is not supported in every single browser, or it's done by JavaScript. Uh, we want all of our actions to still be functional without it, because again, we don't necessarily know how people are browsing our website. And the point is to enhance, not to uh, cut people off from accessing something. So remember to make sure that things are functional without your animation, even though your animation does add value and does make it a better experience for traditional navigation, right? Also, is it optimized? Uh, consider what you're trying to animate. Consider how complex it is. Is, is it a super complex uh, SVG file where you're trying to do all of these things all at once? Um, are you trying to parallax scroll a three megabyte photo up your screen? Why are you doing that? Um, how many paths are you trying to element, uh, animate? How many things are you animating at once? What's going on? Um, we want to try to limit what we need to render. We want to try to limit the size of things that we're interacting with. So just try to optimize it as best as possible. And the last one is, do you need it? Um, don't do it if you don't need it. I mean, if you have a good reason, if you can point to why you're doing something and it's compelling, do it. But don't do it if you don't need it. Don't do it just because it's cool. Don't do it just because you saw it somewhere. I mean, do it on your own to practice it because you saw it somewhere. But don't do it for like production ready sites. Uh, there's a really great quote about this that I saw in uh, the book Animation at Work, uh, which was, uh, don't make something unless it's both necessary and useful, but if it is both necessary and useful, don't hesitate to make it beautiful, right? So my takeaway from that is, you know, be pragmatic first. Um, but if it is something that you do need, if you have gone through those questions and established that you do, it, um, do need it, do it purposefully and do it well. Here's something that's super useless to you right now because it's tiny, uh, but I will give you the link to all the slides. These are a whole bunch of really great resources to learn a little bit more about uh, the principles of animation, especially as they relate to the web. Uh, the first two are great, cssanimation.rocks, uh, which is all of those 12 principles of animation, but done in pure CSS. So you can take a look at that. That's fun. And then jankfree.org because we want to not have janky websites. Uh, so. This is the final slide of, of official content. Here's how to get in touch with me. That's my email. I'm Mark Time Media basically everywhere on the internet, easy to find. Uh, this is the link to the slides, so I will just Vanna White this. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, uh, where to find me next? So I'm going to hang out right now and answer questions until the end of the session. Um, after this, I, I'm going to be hanging out in the SiteGround booth because I'm a SiteGround ambassador, and so I, I you know, get to do a bunch of fun stuff with them. So come say hi to me. Uh, otherwise, I'll be in the hallway track. I'll maybe be in some sessions. Uh, I'm, I'll maybe be randomly exercising. I don't know. I do that sometimes online. I've been on a lot of podcasts. You might see me around. If you have a podcast and you need a guest, I like talking, so that sounds fun. And in person, the next WordCamp I'll be at uh, officially is WordCamp Minneapolis. But otherwise, uh, I'll be here throughout the rest of the day. So cool. Good ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. Applause for all of you, because you sat in this hot room with me. That was fun. Good. All right, let's do questions. Yeah, I, I know I was a little late because I was born to have this engineer. But I, with the animation, I don't know if you recommended um, where we can go on our site, particularly those of us. Like, I have an empty month blog. And I have animation now, but I find it to be a little slow. Sure. So I just upgraded to business for that particular one. I don't know if because of the cost of the platform, it was a little slower because it was a premium. Okay. Um, what can we do when it's 
So, so you're talking about using animation on your site. I want to clarify. So are you on um, WordPress.com? Yes. OK. So being able to customize WordPress.com is a question that I'm not super qualified to answer, just because I, I do all custom development, you know, .org self-hosted stuff. Um, maybe something, especially if you've upgraded to a higher plan, you probably have a higher tier of support. And so that's probably something really great to ask them about, like, hey, my, my, I have animation. It seems very slow. Uh, is there anything that I can do? Because they, they kind of control all of the server side stuff that you, so I mean, I would say talk, talk to them. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's why you pay them the money. So like, use it. <laughs> Good, all right, awesome. Yes. Sure. Uh, so the question is about using uh, animated GIFs and or GIFs in, I'm, I'm going to say it both ways because I don't want to <laughs> take a side, um, uh, in newsletters and whether there is a, a compelling source of them that are, well, okay, so I mean, I think they're inherently kind of supposed to be lame a little bit, but most, uh, and they're also going to be kind of big uh, and hard to download just because they're multiple frames as opposed to one. Um, but I think if you look into, and I don't have a specific resource for you, but if you look more into like motion photography as opposed to, to looking for it, like usually if you're looking for that, you're going to find like memes and like dorky, like let's recut this anime into this other thing, you know, like that kind of stuff, which I find hilarious. Um, but I think if you look more into like, motion photography type stuff, it's more classy. They're usually kind of trying to play with the whole um, dimensionality of stuff. Uh, so maybe look into that. I don't have a great resource because I like, I like the dorky ones. Um, so <laughs> that's cool. Any, yeah, sure. Any other questions? They don't even have to be about design, I mean, about UX necessarily. I could talk about design. I could talk about whatever you want. This is like free, free design advice. Nobody wants free advice. That's fine. Oh, hi. Not really a question, but just more of a discussion point. So okay. If you, you know, are obviously interested in animation on the web, do you, have you done any work or any experience or any thoughts on uh, WebGL, like 3D in the web browser? Um, I haven't actually. So most of most of what I'm doing is very like low level UX experiential. Um, I follow a lot of really awesome animation people on Twitter. Uh, one, a couple people that I would recommend following. Uh, one woman, her name is uh, Valhead V L H on Twitter. She's fantastic. Um, another one. Um, Yuna Kravitz, I can't remember what her, I think it's just like Yuna, it's like really easy. But anyway, they're both like super, super smart people and that's where I get all my like super cool inspiration from. I'm not doing anything cutting edge, although I'm aware of what you're talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, the world is your Twitter oyster, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Terrible answer to your question, cool. <laughs> just a discussion. Yeah, no, that's, really yeah. Yep. There's a lot of really awesome cutting edge stuff and I cannot believe that so much is possible on the web nowadays. It's amazing. I am like really sweaty. It is hot in here. Cool. Um, I'll let you, you all can go because it's warm. Go, go cool off. Thank you for coming. Thank I'll be downstairs. <laughs>